This is my observations of a rural nurse. Um, it was published last year. It's my first, first book. I'm a late starter. Um, and I think what I'll do is tell you a bit about the history um, that led to the book. I didn't really set out to do a book or even really be a photographer. I just like taking photographs. But I, um, it goes back to 1960, our family went to Kākehī in the King Country uh, for the first time. And my parents liked it so much, they bought a place there um, for the trout fishing. They ended up living there six months of the year. We had all our holidays there. Um, and now further down the track, I've been living there permanently or 11 years. Um, I worked in Wellington as a, as a neonatal nurse and a midwife, and I took photographs. I always took photographs, but I never did anything with it. Um, when I was working as a district nurse, I was actually thrilled to be put as a district nurse so that I got a car and I drove around the, the district and I and met the people in their homes, which was quite different to neonatal intensive care. Um, but as I went, I realized that I was seeing parts of the country that I didn't actually know before and not many people. And I was seeing it from a completely different angle. And I started taking photographs. I, I saw a goat on a, on a porch in the middle of the town. And I thought that that looked, it was just so sort of quirky. And I stopped and took a photograph of it with my cell phone. And then shortly after that, my brother suggested that I go on Instagram because he said, no one ever sees your photographs. Um, I didn't, I wasn't interested in social and I didn't, I wasn't too sure about it at all, but I put the go to, and I thought I'll do a little series. I didn't really know how to go about Instagram and I thought I'll do a series. And I thought I'll, I'll call it Observations of a Rural Nurse. And that's, that's really how the title came around. Um, and then I noticed of oh, Anna Miles of the Anna Miles Gallery in Auckland was following me on, on Instagram. And she sent a message that I come and see her when I came to Auckland and um, I got quite excited about that but then I thought oh no don't be silly don't get excited because you'll get disappointed and she took me on and I had my first um, solo exhibition I think 2016 and that was a great success um, it was it was actually really nice to put your work out there and have it recognized and get incredible feedback. And then she said, what about a book? And I thought that would be lovely, a book of photographs. And um, I put some together and presented it to, to her. And she said, but you've got a story. And it just kept growing. And Haru Samashima, he had a look and he, he was quite keen it but then he said no this is this is going to be too big a book he, he said you need a publisher to I wouldn't have got funding to afford to do it myself and the book just kept growing every time someone suggested something new um, and anyway Anna Miles just was a hundred percent supportive the whole time and that was fantastic because I think I would have just thought, oh no, this is too hard. And I also had no idea where to start. And then we got Sarah Gladwell, who had designed some books and had done some design work for Anna. And she started making suggestions and that, um, it started to fall into place and it just kept tuning into something much bigger than I thought. 
depressing because how do you find a publisher? One publisher said nice photographs, but no thank you. Um, so we sort of sat back a while and then Anna talked to Nicola Leggett at the um, Massey University Press and she agreed to do the book and that was it, it was all go. And she said, we need more work. And that was fine with me because I had another 500 photographs at home. Um, and she said, start writing and do more writing. And I kept writing and and I was being, there was quite a bit of pressure to tell the story that I couldn't see because I couldn't see the story, I think, because I was too close to it. But I wrote about the history and how I used to do photography. And I just liked taking any shot of anything that appealed to me. And so the collection was, in the end, fairly substantial. And, and also the book was put together so slowly that, um, well, over a few years, which was really good because it just gave me that time to get a real feel for what I really wanted in there and not put things in filling gaps. So every there's about 140 photographs and, and every single one, I think I've got a story for it. And they're all important to me. Um, the, anyway, the, the designing, the designing was, um, that was really good working with Sarah. I don't think we ever disagreed on anything. She came up with the idea of the paper and the cover and um, the, the layout of each page. And I was a little bit worried about the paper because I worried that it would lose the density, the color but it was, it was great. And it, I think it, it's a, got a soft, soft texture, texture. I think it actually suits the subject. Um, anyway, we, the, um, yeah, we, it finally came out. And then um, I think that was, that was the biggest thing. The first time I laid hands on the book, I just said, oh my God, it's actually serious. Um, I'll just show you. Now I'll go back to the layout. We, um, this is one just to give you an idea. That's an example of the rural area I went to. That was a road I used to go up once a week to see a baby with a heart condition. And that was one way, 14 kilometers with deer and, and goat on the, on the track. And that's the, um, I took quite a few photographs on that, that one. This is one, I, at the back of the book is a fam, what I call the family album. And that's really almost like a pictorial um, family history of us being at Kākahi. And that's one um, that was taken the first year we went there. That's my, the little cottage we stayed in the first time. It's got a place. Um, that's my brother and I on the lawn. And that's me holding my father's camera. Um, that was the thing that I never thought of, but he, he just had cameras lying around. He had he had he was a, an artist he had paint everywhere we took painting and cameras and photography completely for granted and i didn't it was just part of everyday life so i didn't sort of see anything exciting or extraordinary about it um, i used to just pick up ca his camera and take photographs which i actually never saw again um, and this is one of our family in the village after it was after my father's death I had that was a, they had a memorial service at the Marae and 
the service the whole day at, at the Marae um, with some of the of the local people at Kākehi. So we had this sort of sense of belonging there. So I had this nice sort of, not comfort, but I could roam around and take photographs and, and they, they were lovely. They all completely accepted it and have supported me through all this. Uh, but I'll get to that later. I know I'm going all over the place, but never mind. Um, Oh, going back to Sarah Gladwell with the layout, I had a meeting with her and which was really good because we talked about, she, she had her ideas of how it might go, how we sort of grouped the photographs. And I told her what my, how I, I don't think we ever disagreed. She, we sort of, worked quite well together and it was really nice having someone else seeing it from a slightly different perspective and getting more ideas. And what we did, we then Anna and I, when it came down to the fine tuning, Anna and I printed off every photograph on black and white on plain paper. And then in her studio, on was closed, laid the whole lot out on the floor and put them in order. And then once we got the order of a few rows, and then I'd photo photograph these scraps of paper all over the floor, and then we sent them off to Sarah in Sydney and said, this is the order. Um, she never questioned any of it. She, she got it exactly right. But what we did was um, broke up sections and put in a landscape here and there, or that's, that's a view of from my veranda. That's where I now live permanently. And, and it's because of things like that view that I live there. Um, and one of the things that I kept photographing was my tree that's on my driveway. And especially when I was nursing, going to, to work early in the morning and I had this tree in different seasons, different lights, different times of day. I've got summer ones, I've got evening light, and here's an early morning one going to work when it's minus six. Um, I'll just pause there for a moment. The, um, we got the book out there. Oh, working with Nicola Leggett and the publishers, that was really good. The, we presented the book and I don't, I don't, they changed a thing. Um, we'd sort of agreed on everything. And the main thing was we got the book out there and that was a huge relief and um, really exciting actually, because I had no idea how it would go. It came out just after lockdown and someone said it was sort of like a, um, a nice little treat after lockdown. But um, we're on to, there's been two reprints since then, two reprints within eight months. So it's 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 sort of struck a chord somewhere. And the reaction of people was just phenomenal, especially at Kākehi and Tamaranui. And I didn't expect that when I was doing the writing. I didn't I didn't think anyone would read it. I I actually didn't think it would have a wide um that people would in Tamaranui would take much notice but um the pride is incredible and i think what it is too is that the photographs of the people um it's their story and so when i took the book other people that were in it and gave it to them. They it was emotional. Some of them, some of them cried. And the bookseller in Tamaranui said to me, "You've made people feel as though they matter." And it's a very forgotten part of the country. It's neglected in lots of ways, and it's it's not a wealthy place. And but people have great pride, and they their homes 
tell more about them. And so it's for them to be noticed. And when I've asked to photograph them, they, they often used to laugh and say, why on earth would you want to photograph my home? Um, they couldn't quite, they didn't, I kept saying, but you know, you, your home shows the story. And this one of Manu, when I asked him if I could photograph him in his store, and he immediately turned around my father's books in a row. He sells them, he gets them second hand and then sells them at a vast profit. <laughs> and, and then he, and, and he's still selling them along with mine now, but he put them in a row and I thought, oh, so we we a bit sort of, I wasn't comfortable with it. I just thought it was not what I wanted. And he said, no, that's where they go. And then he um, stood there proudly. And in the end, that's the photograph I used because that was the one that he chose. He said, well, not, he didn't choose it. He, he set it up the way he wanted it. So it's, it's about Manu and this one, Erehi, I asked her and she, she's a fierce woman. <laughs> and she said, I thought, well, at least you'll say no, yes. And she said, yes, she was very keen, but she wanted her Korowai fixed before I took it. And that took months. And in the end, I went to her and, and said, um, you know, I'm sick of waiting. Can't we just take the photograph? And she said, I've got it. I've, I've bought one. And she brought it from the Otrahonga um, tourist, Japanese tourist shop. <laughs> and I, I suspect it's made in Japan and it's fake dog hair. The feathers are, aren't recognizable for New Zealand, um, but she's very proud of it and she wanted it for the photograph and she's there painting on her um, her eyebrows for the photo shoot, she said. And she was the one that wept when she got it because she was so proud. And I also photographed her home. I don't know if I put that. Yes, I did. Um, I asked her about the wall can I photograph that and I said what do we what do you call a wall like that and it's we ended up calling it the memorial wall because it's they're all her deceased Fano and friends and she told me about the whole lot and about her weaving and those are her first efforts of weaving hanging there when she was young so that was moment when the book came up for Eruhi. And then we have, now I'll just skip past these, I'll come back to these. There was Shane. I asked Shane if he was, that was a household I went to quite often. And one day I spotted the orange chair and the washing and the pink rose in the drizzle actually, and asked him if I could photograph it. He he's, didn't take much notice. He, he wasn't that interested. But he followed me. And Shane has a lot of theories on life. And I always found him very entertaining. And, and that day, he was telling me that the woes of the world are because um, GPs aren't prescribing Valium anymore. And he said, when, when they prescribe Valium, women and did the baking and men mowed the lawns and tidied the backyard. And he said, and then they stopped and he said, and, and the world's just fallen apart. And so he, while he was telling me all this, I started listening because I was interested. <laughs> and he just came and leant on the chair. And, and that was, in the end, that was my favorite one. And suddenly the photograph isn't about the chair and the yellow sheet. It's William and, and, and Shane. And then probably my, my star <laughs> is Alan Tomata. Um, he lived in Kākehī, sorry. Um, lived in Kākehī. I used to photograph him and he, um, 
it was fine because he said, Sarah, you know perfectly well, I love having my photograph taken. That one was actually taken when we were waiting for a bride in the church at the in Kākahi, and the bride was about, I think, nearly an hour late, and so everyone sort of wandered off. And, and I said to Alan, can I get a shot of you in your Mexican bandit outfit? And he, he was officiating, but he's a sort of lay, was a lay priest, I suppose, um, preacher, whatever. Um, and he, no, he then claimed later to be the most photographed person in Kākahi, which he actually was. I must have about 10 ones that I've kept that I really like. This was one where he just turned up to give to tell me some idea he had. And that's in his pink sort of velvet jacket. And he'd been to mass that day. Um, as he got older and, and couldn't drive, he'd hijack his nieces and, and they'd come down and have a coffee and chat. Um, and this is his, his, I call it Alan's parlor. Well, it's his sort of front room and that's family photographs. And he changes it a lot. So I photographed it a lot. It's all changed now. Um, and that's his home. And his home is just chock-a-block full of, he's got a room with royal families, Maori and, and Queen Elizabeth. He loves, loves the royals. Um, but his home, literally, it tells you more about a person than I think any other home I've ever been into. And this is in one of his spare rooms, the Madonna. She's in another room now. But um, Alan, Alan died at Easter and I was down south traveling in my van with my dog. But um, in the end, I, I felt I, I can't not go. So I flew to Wellington and my son drove me back up to Kākahi for the Tangi and I was asked to do a eulogy and this was for about two or three hundred um, to Whareitoa. Uh, it was fairly daunting. Um, it was a fantastic privilege and just explaining the friendship. It was in the end I think the photography really um, sort of sealed it in a way and it becomes a, a relationship. It, you know, Alan really made me look at what, what you're doing when you're photographing people because I often, most of the time, I'm just taking it spontaneously, very rarely set up. Probably only Erahi um, was the one that she chose to pose and, and, and Manu. But it's it's a, a real sort of relationship between the the photographer and the photographed. And it's actually the photographer is the person making the image, but really it's like this one, it's his photo. It's about him. And I'm the facilitator of putting it out there for him. And I just found that, especially with him, and most of the people in my book I do know through working or living there, and they, um, sometimes I photograph people I don't know, but usually what I like is when you ask them, they're interested in what you're doing, sort of sets up a conversation, and then you find you sort of, there's some sort of bond, and you get to know them a bit more, and you hear lovely stories. And so, um, yeah, that's sort of it. It's um, a privilege to be able to do a lot of these and to go into the homes. And I think I had a unique situation. I had, I had to give up the nursing a bit, partly because I had to get the book done. It was taking too long. and. I might have been the casual nurse, but it meant I worked five days a week. 